All right. Okay. First one. Thank you. Yep. Welcome everyone to our international ground round. I'm very, I'm very glad today. Uh, one of uh, my, my really friends uh, and uh, one of our past president of the ERS Juniors uh, and founder of the ERS Juniors uh, guest today. So good morning, Catherine. Good morning, Poya. Thank you very much for inviting me. Great this to see you looking so well. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to having you here. Uh, Catherine Rennie is a consultant in rhinology at the Charing Cross Hospital. I've uh, I've met her many years ago. It was in 2014. I've spent uh, as an observer's ship in there at the Charing Cross, and she started. She were actually part of the um, of the Charing Cross Hospital as a registrar, and and then she finally became a consultant. And, it, and I'm very proud of her um, steps. So today I've requested from Catherine to discuss a very tough. Uh, uh, topic which is chronic rhinosinusitis and cystic fibrosis. Uh, for those who don't know, um, Catherine spent the time also at the Royal Brompton Hospital, where they in London, where they also treating patients uh, with cystic fibrosis. Uh, and since I'm also part uh, of our hospital in Italy, uh, in Perugia, in Gubbio, uh, regarding, and we're treating cystic fibrosis patient, I've requested her to talk about this. So for everyone, please do remind that all the questions should be asked at the end of her talk. So Catherine, uh, just let me, let me briefly do it like this. Catherine will start uh, the presentation between 30, 35 minutes. Uh, we will have 10 minutes for discussion. Everyone can uh, type uh, the questions uh, directly in the chat board over here in the application. For those participating from Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitch, YouTube, they can just type in there and we will ask the question. So thank you so much and let's proceed with the presentation. Okay, thank you, Poya. I hope you can see my screen. I just want to say thanks very much for sorting out all these webinars. I think you're ahead of the game on this. You started doing them nearly a year ago, and since the COVID pandemic, they've really taken off. So well done on all the hard work putting it together. As Poya said, um, he worked with us at Charing Cross Hospital and has come along to some of our clinics at the Royal Brompton Hospital, where we're one of the um, biggest national cystic fibrosis centers, hence I have the talk on chronic rhinosinusitis and cystic fibrosis today for you. First of all, we'll just go through a bit of background for you. So here, looking at the world map, you can see what the prevalence of cystic fibrosis is. And the hotspots, as you can see, really are the UK. Ireland has the highest prevalence in the world, where around one in every 1,500 have cystic fibrosis, which is a real hotspot, as are the Faroe Islands. It mainly affects Caucasians, but can affect anybody. And the Northern Hemisphere is um, more uh, susceptible than the rest of the world so far. So just to tell you about the joint clinic we do. So the Royal Brompton Hospital is a specialist uh, respiratory and cardiac hospital in London. And it is the largest center for cystic fibrosis in Europe. They look after around 700 adult patients with cystic fibrosis. And I do the joint clinic looking at adult patients there and operating on their sinuses. They also care for children with CF, but that is done by one of my colleagues in terms of the surgical procedures for them. And of note, the first FES that was done in a cystic fibrosis patient was done by one of my predecessors here at Charing Cross, Mr. Ian Mackay, who many of you might be aware of from the Lund Mackay scoring system. So he was one of the very early adopters of endoscopic sinus surgery in the cystic fibrosis population. And he set up this joint ENT and respiratory clinic, which has been really crucial in treating people with cystic fibrosis and making sure that they get good input from all clinicians. One of the keys for cystic fibrosis management is working as part of a really good multidisciplinary team. There are many specialties involved in their care and integrating this care, we have very good clinical nurse specialists who liaise with the patients and keep all their records together, ensure all their appointments are kept together and the annual reviews are done. In the ENT clinic, um, we see patients referred from the respiratory specialist jointly with a respiratory physician. So we will observe them together and go through all their medications and medical records. Just a bit about cystic fibrosis in general. I'm sure most of you know already know all the background to this. It is an autosomal recessive condition. 
it is one in 25 in Europe that carry the CF gene. So if you have to have two parents who are carriers in order for a child to develop cystic fibrosis, and the chance of that child having it is 25%. There's a 50% chance of the children being carriers and a 25% chance of the child being unaffected. There are many mutations of, that have been found in the cystic fibrosis genes, um, but there are a few that predominate, and we'll have a little look at those slightly closer. So this shows you the problem area in cystic fibrosis. It's located on chromosome seven, and one allele comes from the father, one from the mother, and it's the CFTR gene that is involved. And this codes for a chloride channel in the cell membrane that allows the transport of chloride in and out of the cell, and also bicarbonate as well. Um, with this gene, there are over a thousand different mutations possible, of which about 125 of them are causative of cystic fibrosis. So when we see patients, we often are given their genotype, and depending on their genotype, they may have more or less severe disease. So moving on, this shows you the different types of mutations. We, brief, we broadly break them down into six different groups, and they're broken down depending on the um, action on the chloride channel. So I think if you can see my mouse there, this is the normal situation where you have chloride channels and chloride passing out. In the first type, you can see that there's no protein being uh, produced. In the second type, which is more common, then there's no traffic and no signaling within the cell. The third type, you don't get functional um, membrane proteins. Fourth type, they have less function they should have. Fifth type, there's less protein being produced. And then in the sixth type, then they're unstable. These types have become more important in the treatment of cystic fibrosis more recently, as they have looking at specific targets in which medications can work and help treat. So we're now looking at things that can act on these different mutations in order to treat different people's um, particular mutation. And that means that it's a more personalized medicine approach with precision medicine going forward. The most common one that most people will remember from medical school is the Delta F508 mutation on chromosome seven. And that is around 88% of our um, cystic fibrosis population. But how does a problem with this gene relate to problems in mucociliary clearance? The difficulty is if you're not getting chloride leaving through the channels, then you end up with a collapse in the sol layer of mucus. So the mucus layer that sits on top of your cells is composed of a sol layer, the thin, really, um, really easy to move layer and a gel on top of it. So the cilia move back and forth in the sol layer and then the gel is transported along the top. In cystic fibrosis, you end up with a collapse in the sol and it becomes very viscous. 30 to 60 times more viscous than in the normal situation. And as a result, you don't get that mucociliary clearance. You get a buildup of the mucus on top, which becomes very tenacious, thick, and sticky. And in the sinuses, that will give you osteal obstruction, hypoxia, edema, and then you get bacterial infections building up in the sinuses. The host mounts an inflammatory response, and you can get inflammatory tissue there. And ultimately, this sinus infection can progress to the lungs and lead to damage to the lungs and reduction in pulmonary function. So moving on, how do we diagnose cystic fibrosis? So since 2007 in the UK and earlier in Scotland in 2003, we've been part of a national newborn screening program. This is the case around most of Europe and the US now as well. So most cystic fibrosis is now picked up at birth. So in the first five days um, of life, there's a heel prick test done, which checks for common um, genetic diseases, of which cystic fibrosis is one of the ones checked. However, if you get a positive heel prick test, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have cystic fibrosis, as it will also often pick up carriers of CF as well. You need to have further testing beyond this as well. And that further testing comes in the... Um, shape of a sweat test. Here's an example of a child undergoing a sweat test. So you put a, a piece of paper on the arm and put an electric current over the top. 
Um, and you would then send the paper off to be checked with the chloride content in it. And depending on the chloride content, it will give you an indication of how likely cystic fibrosis is in that sweat. Um, there are also genetic tests available. However, for diagnosis, we don't rely on the genetic test alone. It's usually accompanied by a positive um, chloride test. And we also need to look for two mutations when we're looking at the genetic testing. And if you have two mutations of, uh, seen in the test, then you're very likely to have um, cystic fibrosis. There's a good specificity and sensitivity on that. So how does cystic fibrosis present to ENT? Well, I'm very fortunate working with a national CF centre, so most of mine comes from the CF unit, referral to our joint clinic. We usually see every patient, any patient, sorry, with upper respiratory symptoms. If you have any unexplained recurrent chest infections and they're concerned that it's a sinus infection leading to recurrent chest infection, they will be referred in. And screening prior to any heart lung transplants, because we don't want colonization of the sinuses to affect the new organ that is um, being given to the patient. And we want to prevent colonization of the lungs for as long as possible. The other classic we've all learned about is nasal polyposis in children. So most common cause of nasal polyps in children is cystic fibrosis when they're bilateral. Um, and despite the newborn screening, cystic fibrosis does still present to ENT departments with polyps. And that's because some people may have missed the screening, people travel around, and in London, we have influx of population from all around the world where screening may not have been as prevalent as it is in the UK. The polyps, they become more common as the children get older, and they're in around 50% of adolescents with cystic fibrosis. And you should be particularly suspicious of cystic fibrosis if the child's also exhibiting poor weight gain, respiratory disease, and gastrointestinal abnormalities. As those are the systems that cystic fibrosis will attack. So in terms of the polyps themselves, they're quite different to the usual polyps that we see when we have chronic rhinosinusitis. They are typically um, not isinophilic, whereas in CRS with polyps, we often see isinophilic polyps. They have a very thin, delicate basement membrane, which you can see in the histopath slide here. And there's a preponderance of acid mucin in the glands and cysts of those polyps. In specific features we look at, there's usually minimal damage to the surface epithelium of the polyp. They have a mucus blanket um, lining the apical epithelium. They have intracytoplasmic lumina, fenestrated capillaries, lots of degranulated mast cells, and plasma cells, and what they say are intracisternal Russell bodies, which I'm sure your histopathologist will be able to tell you more about. There's a smaller number of isinophils in comparison to with all the, all the other non-CF polyps. So in terms of microbiology, this is an endoscopic picture of the typical appearance when we're operating on somebody with cystic fibrosis. Here, the ethmoid air cell has been opened, and inside you can see this um, thick, sticky mucus, which is classic of a pseudomonas infection in cystic fibrosis. It almost has the consistency of peanut butter when you take it out. The prevalence um, of CRS in the cystic population is nearly 100%. So all of them do get problems with their sinuses, or at least the vast majority. And the most common organisms we see are Pseudomonas and Staph aureus as well. And that's based on cultures from the sinuses um, taken at the time of surgery. I don't know if anybody recognizes this quite pretty bacteria here. The pink color is quite good. That is Pseudomonas, which is the main problem you get in cystic fibrosis. So what we found is when you cultured bacteria from the sinuses, they match the bacteria found in the lungs of those with cystic fibrosis. And that's based on brushings, sputum samples, and swabs. And infections that originate in the sinuses can lead to lung colonization, which is why we want to treat the sinuses and prevent that happening. Staph aureus, if you pick it up early in childhood, it's related to a poorer clinical outcome. Equally, if you've got methicillin resistant strains, you have worse progression in the lung disease. And there are, in adults, it's usually the gram negative bacteria that cause the colonization. And the typical bacteria then are Pseudomonas, 
Acromobacter and Burkholderia. So what do the patients present with symptom wise? Well, compared to our other patients with chronic rhinosinusitis, patients with cystic fibrosis actually have very low reporting of their symptoms. We don't really fully understand why that is, but it may be because they've had the symptoms since they were a child, they don't really appreciate them as being any change or any different, and it's something that they've always had. There's also quite a poor correlation between patient symptoms and the disease severity in CF. Again, that's maybe because they're used to dealing with many symptoms over a long period of time, and they have significant um, bowel disease as well as lung disease. When they do have symptoms, it's commonly nasal obstruction, purulent rhinorrhea, headache, anosmia, facial pain, snoring, and change of voice. The headache and periorbital pain are more common in adolescents and adults, and particular to the chronic rhinosinusitis, whereas anosmia is more common in those with polyps. Mucoceles are seen more frequently in cystic fibrosis, and although they're rare in children, you can get a variety of symptoms because of the mucosal causing surrounding pressure, things like epiphora and chronic rhinosinusitis from that. So moving on to what we see clinically and endoscopically, here we have a classic picture of a, this nose has been decongested, but we have a nasal polyp here and some polypoid mucosa and polyps sitting behind as well. On anterior rhinoscopy, if there are big polyps, they're usually quite easily seen. However, you will miss around 25% of polyps by just looking on anterior rhinoscopy. So it's necessary to do an endoscopic examination. And there you're looking at the polyps and the purulent secretions. This gives you an opportunity to take a swab for microbiology in order to target ongoing antibiotic management. We also often see a bulging of the lateral nasal wall in towards the nasal cavity when you have a really full maxillary sinus that's causing distortion of the anatomy. So looking at radiological findings, there are some specific features on scans that we see in patients with CF that we don't see so commonly in patients without CF. In cystic fibrosis, it's quite common to have underdevelopment of the sinuses, the frontal maxillary and the sphenoid, but in particular, quite often in CF, we have frontal sinuses that are either aplastic or hyperplastic, which is really unusual to see in patients without CF. There's also quite a lot of bony sclerosis in sinus walls in cystic fibrosis patients. Sinus pneumatization variations are very common uh, normally, whereas in CF you rarely see this. And in CF you're more commonly seeing mucus seals formed rather than uh, normally where we rarely see that. So these are some uh, CT scans. So this is a coronal CT looking at a patient with cystic fibrosis, and we can see pan sinus opacification. There's really no um, nasal airway that that patient can breathe through. And we can also see there's an expansion of the middle meatus there, where it's been pushed out by the polyps and mucopus within the sinuses. This is a, a coronal and sagittal CT of a child. And here we're looking at an ethmoidal mucosal, which is distorting the anatomy. And you can really see the size on this mucosal in that child is really quite large. And we wouldn't normally see that in anybody without cystic fibrosis. The other finding that we see is the frontal sinus. So yes, we can have frontal sinuses in cystic fibrosis, but very often they're completely aplastic and there's no sinus um, there to be seen. When we've looked at all the different genotypes, we wanted to know what the impact on sinonasal disease is. However, at the moment, this still remains quite controversial. There've been two reasonable studies on this, one in 2014, which was retrospective review, and they found that there was a significant difference between the severity of sinonasal disease and those with high risk genotypes. Um, the high risk genotypes had increasing incidence of a hyperplasia and aplasia and bony sclerosis when looked at the CT scan. However, in 2018, another retrospective review, um, there was no worse sinonasal disease um, in high risk genotypes. And that was looked at on SNOT22 scores nasal endoscopy scores and CT staging scores. So there's still some further work to be done here. Um, only two real studies there. And maybe if we looked at a larger group or larger population, we may find out more information on this, particularly now as we're looking at treatments that target particular mutations. It may be that some of them have greater impact on sinus disease. 
This is a really um, nice chart um, produced by Tina Chen back in 2016. And this shows the life expectancy in patients with cystic fibrosis. And we can see when it was first described in the 1930s, life expectancy was really poor. You weren't even making it to 10 years of age. And over time, you can see the different medications that have come in in treatment of cystic fibrosis and how the life expectancy has improved with that. When they discovered the high salt in sweat, the sweat chloride test, changing diets, first successful pregnancy, and then the proteins and genes being identified. And the most recent identification was only in 1989, which really isn't that long ago. Um, and beyond what's next year, I think that will be the precision medicine and looking at treatments that treat specific mutations. Um, this is heightened uh, screening program, and these are tobramycin uh, inhalation that came in in around 2010. So for our patients with CRS and cystic fibrosis, what do we do treatment wise and what is on offer? The goal for our treatment really is to prevent or delay chronic lung infections, because this is what will lead to life shortening events for these patients. So we want to try and make sure they don't develop colonization of their lungs if possible. However, this is a difficult task as many have already colonized by the time they reach adulthood. So from an ENT point of view, working closely with your CF team and regularly seeing the patients with problems and making sure they're on a good treatment regime can really improve the quality of life in these patients. In terms of medical treatment, we give saline irrigation. There's very good evidence that this can improve symptoms. We use topical antimicrobials, things like uh, nebulized tobramycin to treat pseudomonas within the sinuses. We also give topical nasal steroids. There's been a Cochrane review looking at this in, and although it reduces the polyp size, it hasn't been shown to improve patient symptoms. One of the other things that we always give is DNAs, which is nebulized. And because there's a lot of DNA extruded by the neutrophils in the mucosa in cystic fibrosis patients, which leads to this thick sticky mucus, by giving DNAs, it breaks it down and the mucus thins and patients improve. Mucolytics have also often been given. However, the Cochrane review looking at this found no evidence of it improving lung function in cystic fibrosis lung. However, there have only been limited studies looking at it when you're looking at sinus disease. I guess what everybody thought would be the big breakthrough for cystic fibrosis would be gene therapy. So if we know what the gene is that's causing the problem, surely if we could re just replace it, then we may be able to cure cystic fibrosis. And whilst we've known about the gene since 1989, there really hasn't been any um, big breakthrough in this as yet. There have been gene therapy studies in pigs where they've used an adenovirus to replace the CFTR gene, but this certainly hasn't moved to human studies and is certainly not anywhere near FDA approval as yet. However, when we look at precision medications, which are the newer medications coming in, is Calideco or Cambi, Simkevi, and Trikafta, which is available in the US but not UK yet. These target specific mutations, so will be applicable to different patients with CF depending on their mutation. And they have shown some improvement in symptom control. So we'll look at those in a little bit more detail. Certainly within the UK, these medications have made the national press, particularly within the last year. So these are all headlines from the BBC website from October and November of this year. Um, cystic fibrosis drugs given the green light or can be drug will transform lives and it was going to be available in Wales in November. The difficulty we had it was there's a firm that produces all these medications and they wanted to charge 100,000 per patient per year, which when you have 10,000 patients with cystic fibrosis in the UK and a government led healthcare scheme, we're quickly going bankrupt on things like that. However, there's been significant um, negotiation, the price has come down and as of November, these medications are um, available in the UK, although they have been available in the US for much longer. The one that was first made available, which I think was back in 2015, was Calideco or Ivacaftor. This is a CFTR potentiator, CFTR being the transmembrane protein and chloride channel. 
and this was increasing the probability of channel opening and improving the flow of ions out of the channel. So this was able to target mutations that around 10% of cystic fibrosis patients in the UK have. It's been licensed from six months of age, and it has been shown to improve the lung function in patients with CF. They've also looked at it with some of the chronic rhinosinusitis aspects, and it, in some small studies, it looks like it has a beneficial impact on chronic rhinosinusitis quality of life when evaluated with SNOP20. There are case reports of it improving the CT scan findings in patients with um, CRS, and it's also been found to enhance the effect of some antibiotics. As I said, this is very new, so we'll wait and see what time tells with IFA-CAFCA. The others that have more recently become available, so these top two were only made available in the UK in November of last year, so, or can be, this targets a mutation about 50% of people with CF have. So hopefully we shall have further information about that soon. And Simkevi, which is a combination again, and this improves the cellular transport of CFTR. So hopefully it works on multiple mutation combinations, around 55% of the population would have those. That is only licensed in the over 12s at present. Currently, the TRICAFTA, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in the UK, is trying to get made available here. It's available in the US, and it's hoped that that would target around 90% of mutations that cystic fibrosis patients have. So there are changing things in the face of treatment, medical treatment of CF. They've only really come about in the last couple of years. When we see patients in clinic, we need to assess how good, how good their control of the chronic rhinosinusitis is. And for that, we now got the new EPOS guideline from 2020, which gives us an overview of how well the control is, well controlled, partly controlled or uncontrolled. This is set out for all types of chronic rhinosinusitis. It can equally be used in patients with cystic fibrosis. And it's about their nasal blockage, rhinorrhea, facial pain, smell, any sleep disturbances or fatigue, what nasal endoscopy looks like, and have they needed any rescue treatment or increased treatments in the last um, six months or in the last month prior to their visit. So surgery. Chronic rhinosinusitis in CF patients is often refractory to medical treatment and therefore sinus surgery is recommended. It's been seen to be safe in children despite the anatomical variations there are in these patients. And several reports have said that it will often give a temporary improvement in their lung function, but there is often a need for revision surgery. So we have to be careful on the patients we are selecting for surgery to ensure that we're picking people that would likely benefit. Um, and sinus surgery is recommended for those, as I mentioned earlier, with lung transplants to help to eradicate the ground negative bacteria and avoid um, recolonization of their lungs. So sinus surgery and CF, um, majority of data about it comes from retrospective studies and case series. Patients with cystic fibrosis have a greater burden of sinus disease than the usual chronic rhinosinusitis we see. The revision rates are much higher in cystic fibrosis patients, and most studies don't show a sustained benefit of the level of pulmonary function or pulmonary morbidity. But we have to remember the natural progression of cystic fibrosis is that lung function will deteriorate over time. Um, and that's something that further studies need to look into in more detail. Most experts at present recommend extensive sinus surgery. So we widely open all the sinuses to prevent mucus being trapped and bacterial recolonization. And the idea of using meticulous daily irrigations to rinse through the sinuses postoperatively. So the surgery for cystic fibrosis, our current practice, all surgery is done under general anesthetic. We're doing more radical surgery in cystic fibrosis population than we do in our normal chronic rhinosinusitis population. And there is an intensive pre and post-operative regime that patients follow. The photo here at the bottom shows a typical polyp uh, in CF coming out of the nose. So I've, in setting up this talk, I've reviewed our last four years of cystic fibrosis operations that we've done at Charing Cross. We've looked at 52 patients, there were 61 operations, 22 female and 30 male. The average age was 30 years, but the range was from 18 to 62. 
And you've got to remember 62 is a really good age for somebody with cystic fibrosis when their median life expectancy is only around 40 years. So looking at our results, this was the number that had previous sinus surgery or transplant. Eight patients had had sinus surgery elsewhere. We had three heart lung transplant patients and five solely lung transplant patients in that group. When we looked at what microbial colonization there was, the majority of patients who were colonized in their sinuses with pseudomonas, but we also picked up Staph aureus, Burkholderia, and even Aspergillus as well in these patients, which is typical of what we're seeing in the literature as well. And then when we went on and looked at our need for revision surgery, so of the group we saw, 17% needed revision surgery within four years. We compared this to the literature values. So there was a large cohort study from a Scandinavian group that um, looked at 106 patients with cystic fibrosis, and they found a revision rate of 28% within three years. That suggests that we're doing reasonably well, but it may be that that study was now probably about eight years ago, and maybe we're being more radical with our surgery now than people were then. So the need for revision is perhaps less although that only time will tell and we have to look at it more carefully. The risk factors for needing recurrent surgery. If you have a high lund mackay score at your initial surgery, you're more likely to need a revision. And if you have a higher grade of polyp, you're also more likely to need revision surgery. So all our surgery, as I said, is done under a general anesthetic. And I'm very lucky that we work with a team of very experienced anaesthetists, which allow safe general anesthesia in all our CF patients, including those with transplants. We're doing more extensive surgery and clearance um, to give a better cavity to keep clean afterwards than we did previously. And this is my anaesthetist, Marla, who um, I'm very fortunate to work with as she is able to put all of my complicated patients to sleep without uh, batting an eyelid and is really a fantastic anaesthetist. And when you're working with difficult patients like this, who have reduced lung function, they're often diabetic, they may be immunosuppressed because of their transplant, they're on IV antibiotics, they've got Hickman lines in, PICC lines in, and multiple other comorbidities, you really need to have a great relationship with your anaesthetic team because it's as a team that we are able to deliver this service. Um, as I said previously, we're doing more radical surgery than we did previously, and our aim is to eradicate the disease and leave a wide surgical cavity that allows long-term care with topical medications and sinus rinsing. So we're doing a sphenoethmoidectomy, a large middle meal androstomy, draft one, and in certain cases, if there are frontal sinuses available at, um, at present, and they're very large frontal sinuses with disease, we are opening to a draft three, but that's only in a minority of cases. I can only think of three in the last four years that we've needed to do that for. So these are some examples of patients that we've seen with a cystic fibrosis, the typical type of scan you're seeing with um, sinus opacifications throughout. And here's a video of us removing polyps from a patient and you'll see the typical pseudomonas type mucus behind there that we clear out as we do our surgery. The microdebrider is your friend in cystic fibrosis operating in order to remove all the nasal polyps. And we have a, another example at the top as well. Oh, that one won't play for me at the moment. Anyway, you get got an example there at the bottom. This is another patient with cystic fibrosis. This is somebody who's obviously had previous surgery. They're quite wide open maxillary sinuses there, but you can see the disease at the top and the intraoperative findings. When you look in both nasal cavities, a lot of thick, sticky mucus there um, and mucopus present. So back in 2013, Hesham Salo, who's my colleague here at Charing Cross, and looked at the doing modified Lothrops in cystic fibrosis patients and wondered, did it have a role? They found a small number of cystic fibrosis patients that had large frontal sinuses and predominant frontal disease did benefit from an endoscopic modified Lothrop procedure as it facilitated rinsing of the frontal sinus and it allowed more free drainage. However, these patients with cystic fibrosis often get a lot more new bone formation than we see in typical CRS patients. And there is a higher chance of um, the 
uh, modified Lothrop closing down due to the osteoneogenesis. It's something to be aware of. What we started using in the last year in Charing Cross in our CF patients we are doing Lothrops in are Propel stents. And here you can see one when it's opened out like a hairnet. And this is it in situ sitting in the um, frontal sinus opening. So lastly is our intensive pre and post operative regime. What do we do? Some of our patients who have severe chest infections and very poor chests have perioperative intravenous antibiotics. Many of these have long lines in, so Hickman lines that they can deliver themselves at home. Others are admitted to hospital for this pre and post surgery. We tell all our patients to use their sinus rinse twice daily. The majority will be on topical steroids long term. And we're also using topical anti-pseudomonal treatment, things like nebulized tobramycin that's inhaled through the nose. And when they use that until there's an eradication of the pseudomonas. So this is one of the larger systemic, systematic reviews, which looked at 24 articles and had 680 patients included in it. It said that there was improvement in symptom measures and endoscopic findings that there was no improvement in lower airway function after surgical therapy. That's something that we have to be aware of. We're doing this in order to try and improve their chests and how much are we actually improving. So the jury's out on some of the cystic fibrosis papers. I think there is more evidence coming through gradually and we'll see how much surgery we should do, what extent of surgery should we be doing. We certainly find that particularly in the transplant patients to prevent colonization of the lungs, then this has uh, a good role in preventing that further colonization. Um, and also patients who are very symptomatic from their sinuses will benefit from surgery. But it's certainly not for every single patient we have. And as you can see, we've done 52 cases in the last three years, and we have over 700 patients we look after with cystic fibrosis. This is an excellent summary that was in Hamelos's paper in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. It's just an overview of the CRS features in patients with cystic fibrosis, and it goes as a refresher. So you have your genetic predisposition, the CF mutations that may increase risk in some patients. You get your increased viscosity and decreased mucus mucociliary clearance. Then you get your infection and biofilm formation. You have your typical bacteria involved, staph in children, pseudomonas in adults, and then the more unusual pathogens that you typically see in cystic fibrosis. The radiographic abnormalities we've talked about and discussed and looked at. And then we get the polyp formation with the unusual histology. We go on to have the medical treatment, the staph and the pseudomonas antibiotics and then the irrigation, the topical steroids, and the DNAs we give as well. In terms of surgery, extensive surgery to ensure wide sinus patency, and then post-operative culture-directed antibiotics. So in conclusion, CF patients are best managed in a multidisciplinary team approach, and we're very fortunate to work with a great team here at Charing Cross. Um, the improvements in medical management and anesthesia seem to have enhanced surgical outcomes. The purpose of surgery is to eradicate the disease and create a wide surgical cavity, and meticulous long-term post-operative care is essential in these patients. It is an evolving field for future research. We need to look at the correlation between cystic fibrosis, genotype, and severity of cyanonasal disease. We need to know more about the association with, between heterozygotes in cystic fibrosis and chronic rhinosinusitis, as it has been seen to be more common in people who are carriers of the CF gene. And also we want to know what's the best CT staging system in this condition, um, as it seems to be different than the normal CRS. Also, the extent of sinus surgery that is important in cystic fibrosis. Certainly from our own experience as a department at the Royal Brompton, we've found that when we've done more extensive surgery, we've had less need for recurrent surgery and we were doing less extensive surgery more than 10 years ago. And there has been an obvious decrease in our revision rate during that time frame. But thank you very much for listening today. And thank you, Poya. I'll give a hand over to you for questions. Thank you so much for the brilliant presentation. We do have many questions. I will try to arrange it from the 
one of the earliest one to the last one. Um, I do have a, a question for myself. Um, there were there was a debate on Timozin one alpha. Have you did you have any experience in that? Have you heard anyone starting with this? Um, we deal specifically with the. Um, the respiratory physicians when we're looking at starting these medications and the deal uh, it's not from the ENT point of view ourselves that we recommend it it's usually the respiratory team that will want to start it for their chest and things like that certainly when we're using nebulized medications and the newer mutations the respiratory team are following our patients very carefully and we're just at the moment as many of the newer ones we haven't used for that long we're just taking a careful look at how they're changing sinus symptoms and we're still needing to do sinus surgery mm -hmm. and certainly with um, antibiotics and um, DNAs and things we're nebulizing it and when patients are nebulizing medication we ask them to nebulize and breathe in through their nose so they get some uh, effect in their sinuses as well as just breathing through the mouth okay I do, I do agree with you. It's the importance of having an anesthesiologist that allows you to do it. It's mandatory. We are always, you know, having arguing with our team because, uh, you know, they will try to avoid as much as possible surgery if not really needed. And then I, another thing that I would like to pinpoint is the importance of a team is mandatory right now. Cystic fibrosis is always seen as a multi-organ, but they always, you know, looking at. Uh, GI and the lungs, but they don't care about sinuses, which is very important, by the way. So let's go with some some questions. The first one, it's uh, from Renata. It's a great presentation. A treat cystic fibrosis patient in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Do you make make megantrostomy in the first surgery? Oh, in the first surgery, you make a very large antrostomy. Um, but at revision surgery, we would then think about doing a megarantrostomy down to the floor of the nasal cavity, removing part of the inferior turbinate. net. Certainly not at the first surgery, as we have many patients who haven't needed to have a megarantrostomy when they've had the original antrostomy. But if they are needing further surgery again, then certainly we would consider it if their maxillary sinuses is where the major problem is. Yeah, and collect and recollect into this. So we also have a colleague, Joao, from Portugal. He's asking, what about inferior antrostomy in cystic fibrosis patient? Is there any place for inferior antrostomy or mega antrostomy? There's certainly a place for a mega antrostomy. We're not doing any inferior um, antrostomies because you want a, a normal mucociliary clearance pathway, ideally, but obviously that's not going to work in cystic fibrosis. Ideally, if you can make as big a cavity as possible with a wide opening so that your flush can clear out the disease in there, that is best. Um, I know that some other institutions are going directly and doing megarantrostomies first off. Certainly in the UK, we have many managing without having um, a megarantrostomy removing the inferior turbine at initial surgery. So we only reserve that when revision surgery is required because of um, recalcitrant maxillary sinusitis. Yeah, still from Brazil. Another question is, what age do you indicate surgery for children and adolescents in an attempt for eradication of pseudomonas? Um, I think it depends on the patient. Even some of our adults don't always have pseudomonas colonization, but often they do, and m many do by adulthood. I mainly practice in adults, so I'm only doing adult surgery from um, 18 years onward. But one of my colleagues does the pediatric surgery, and he's certainly doing uh, pediatric sinus surgery from uh, six years onwards if there are complications like mucosils and problems there. Yeah. Another question from Joseph is asking, what is the topical antibiotic that you give for pseudomonas? Cobramycin nebulized is commonly recommended by our respiratory colleagues. Um, I, I was using uh, Dornase Alpha by using vibrating aerosol. And uh, it looks pretty good. The problem is that I'm facing is that they're recommending they prescribe it for the lungs, uh, and that it's uh, it's not in the package for reimbursement for the nose. So if you're using that for your nose, uh, then it's going to be wasted for for the lungs. Another question is coming still: Is navigate nav navigator mandatory for endoscopic sinus surgery as the sinuses are hypoplastic? Um, navigation is not mandatory, but certainly in the patients who've had multiple sinus surgeries and distorted anatomy, 
then it is certainly a very good idea to have it available. Um, certainly in a primary case, even if there are hyperplastic um, sinuses, you can see that on the preoperative scan. It's more important, I think, when there is a lot of previous surgery that's very distorted. US, uh, would you suggest the use of anti-leukotrine? Um, I don't generally prescribe the anti-leukotrines. Um, respiratory team do for some patients, but certainly it's not something that ENT team, ENT team give out generally in the CF clinic, yeah. Question from Russia, would you suggest um, uh, NACL 6% or 0.9 nasal douches? Um, we just use uh, normal saline 0.9%. We're not using hypo or hypertonic. It's just the standard. Okay. There's another one from uh, Sweden. What are the objective measures that you would suggest to evaluate the children under 10 years old? Uh, I might get out of this and play. I don't see children under 10 years old. I mainly do adults. And it's quite difficult to get objective measures on children. Certainly, I mean... You can look at the size of polyps. Some children will let you scope their nose. That will be an objective. Obvious mucopus there. And then I guess you're looking at symptom scores. Obviously more tricky to do in children. People look at the visual analog scale for um, feedback as well. But um, yeah, my practice is mainly adults, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of children, by the way, so it's it's very tough one. Endoscopy is not always possible. So another question also from Renata. Do you use uh, mupirocin topically in the nasal levig? Um, we have done in some patients. We add it to the nasal douche and have used that. It obviously depends on the sensitivities of what's growing in the sinuses. Some people add baby shampoo because it's been seen to break down biofilms. Um, in very difficult to treat cases, then we have tried that as well. So we, there's tons of questions we cannot reply to all of them. Okay. I'm always uh, telling, and I'm always, uh, you know, asking the the speaker, are you okay to provide any kind of email or contact for the people to contacting you for other further questions in the future? Yeah, certainly, people can get me on my uh, work email address here which is katherine.rennie at nhs.net. And I'm happy for people to send me questions if they'd like. Thank you so much. So yeah. for it's, it's, it was a complete review, and uh, which was a, a brilliant one. Cystic fibrosis is not an easy, a, an easy stuff. Many things going on, treatment differences. Uh, we have to make sure that we're providing the best facilities for the patients. Is, is a very specialistic one. So I, I do admire what you've done and I'm really glad that you accept my invitation to talk about this. So uh, thank you once again for, uh, for uh, being with us today, for, uh, for everyone, many compliments from around the world. Um, uh, last, last question, is uh, cystic fibrosis life expectancy in your series? Um, the cystic fibrosis That's life expectancy. I don't know that I haven't got the exact figures offhand for that, but I know that the eldest patient that we operated on was 62. Um, and we see many patients in their 40s and 50s. And I think it's part of them being part of a national center, being picked up early as children, having multidisciplinary input from very early on, gives them the best possible chance of living the longest um, life where they're able to be active during that time and their compliance with their daily physiotherapy their medications and everything like that is really important in the long-term management of cystic fibrosis well yeah. i do agree change during the last years so to, in conclusion for everyone interested you can watch again this uh, this um, topic and and this uh, presentation in our uh, youtube channel also on facebook thank you katherine once again and um i would like to stress that today tomorrow we are going to have another presentation from, from one of our friends and part of a previous ers junior board uh, which is christopher langdon and he's going to talk about septal perforation repair and how they do it the team from barcelona thank you all for being together thank you katherine bring my cheers to hasham as soon as you will see him and i love you so much Okay. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye now.